The Colts are rolling. Winners of four straight. But what do they need to do to cover up their fatal flaws? Let's get to it. You are Locked On Colts, your daily Indianapolis Colts podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right. Thanks for tuning in and making us your first listen of the day. This is your daily podcast covering your Indianapolis Colts, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. What's up, friends and family? This is Jake Arthur and Zach Hicks from HorseshoeHuddle.com. Uh, coming to you after another Colts win. That's four in a row now. Uh, I don't want to say firmly in the playoff seat, but they are hanging on for dear life, and they're they're doing what they need to to stay in there. Uh, but I think we all know this is a flawed team. They are winning games. They're finding new ways to win each week, it seems. Uh, but there are some warts. Uh, so today we're going to identify why the Colts are having such a hard time closing out drives uh, you know, on third downs, you know, converting in the red zone, things like that, uh, how they can fix it. And on the defensive side of the ball, uh, why it's been so rough against the run without Grover Stewart and why are they going to definitely welcome him back uh, this next week against these Bengals. And then on the back end, is the secondary good enough if they are able to punch their ticket to the postseason? Uh, so looking up first, what we're talking about when the Colts are, are struggling uh, finishing off these drives. Right now, they're 21st in the NFL on third down, uh, just 36.3%. That has led to the fourth most uh, fourth down attempts in the NFL with 23. And then when they get into the red zone, not a lot going on there as well. They're 14th in the NFL there, uh, 55%, just 45% in the last three games. Uh, and that has led to being tied for the sixth most, most field goal attempts. Uh, it's, you know, Matt Gay is one of the MVPs of this team uh, for a reason. It's because they're kind of coming up short when it comes to the red zone. Uh, so, Zach, what are you seeing when you look at this team and why is it so hard for them lately? Yeah, you know, it's really funny. I think, uh, you know, I really want to talk about this topic because the last two weeks we've seen the Colts offense kind of get back to where they were. You know, they're an operational offense again these last two weeks. They've been plenty explosive these last two games. They've been hitting on some big plays. They've been able to move the ball. Their high success rate, they're looking pretty good in between the 20s. They're getting down into the 20. Uh, the problem is they're stalling out on the other side of the field way too often, and it's leading to a lot of field goal attempts, and it's leading to a lot of situations where, hey, the other team's getting a chance uh, to tie games or to be in games that they really shouldn't be in. I mean, the last two weeks, the Colts offense has moved the ball to really, really efficient and effective pace, especially through the air. I mean, I think they're over 80% success rate uh, through the air the last two games. And it's not that they've been perfect throwing the ball or just perfect in general on that side of the ball, but they are moving the football more than what we could say we were seeing against the Carolina Panthers and what we were seeing against the New England Patriots those two weeks prior to the bye. Uh, so now, the whole question is, can they finish drives? This past week, they were 20% touchdown um, touchdown percentage in the red zone. Uh, this past game, they were one of five. Uh, one of five attempts in the red zone. They scored a touchdown. They had a turnover on another one, and then they had three field goals. That's not good enough. You can't win games against better teams not converting in the red zone. Now, it's great to have five red zone opportunities. That's, that's awesome. You're moving the ball. You're getting in position to get points, and you're getting points at the end of the day. But you need to finish these drives. You need to score. And before the season, with Anthony Richardson in line to be the starter, you know, I think I said on this podcast plenty of times that the Colts are going to be like top five to top 10 in the NFL in offensive yards per game, you know, rushing yards, passing yards, they were going to get a ton of yards, but they weren't going to be that high in scoring points because it's going to be a struggle in the red zone with a young quarterback finishing off drives. Ironically, what we saw with Anthony Richardson, this offense was phenomenal in the red zone. They were unstoppable in the red zone with Anthony Richardson. I think the only drive they didn't score on with him as their starting quarterback where they got into the red zone was that Jacksonville drive that he didn't finish. Uh, that yeah. whole Jacksonville drive that he did. They scored a touchdown every other red zone drive with Anthony Richardson. Uh, highly effective, highly efficient with him in there. And with Gardner Minshew, we've seen a bit of a drop off. Now, what's the reasoning for this? You know, I think you can look at a number of things. Pass game. 
there were, you know, obviously the, the Gardner Minshew fumble. It comes down to don't fumble the ball there with Gardner Minshew. Uh, you get another one with Gardner Minshew where he misses high to Alec Pierce in the back of the end zone where it should have been an easy touchdown. I mean, I think when the All-22 is posted uh, tomorrow, you guys will see that that should have been a very easy touchdown for the Colts that Minshew just got happy feet and missed. Uh, so you can you can look at the quarterback on some of these, but also you can look at the play calling. I mean, they get very run heavy, uh, run, run, pass heavy in the red zone. And, and maybe those are not the right calls. Maybe you're not being aggressive enough on those early downs in the red zone. Uh, we saw Shane Steichen basically give up on one third down with a screen pass call. That just wasn't good enough. I mean, you really need to be throwing it to the end zone there. Uh, we saw him get too cute on the one yard line, try to do a, some, some wide play action call that got sacked and led to another field goal after the blocked punt. Like, this is not just a one person thing. I'm not going to sit here and say it's only Gardner Minshew that they're not scoring because uh, Shane Steigen is overthinking things a little bit and getting too conservative other times too aggressive. Uh, but the main thing to point out here really is, look, I'm glad the Colts are moving the ball again. The success rate is good. The offense is operational. They're moving the football the last two weeks. Uh, now the next step is actually scoring touchdowns because when you play against better teams than the Tennessee Titans or even the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which I, I know that may, may not happen in the regular season here, but if they end up making the playoffs, you need to convert when you get in the red zone. You just can't settle for field goal every single time because that's going to come back to haunt you in one of these games. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a real issue that the Colts need to look at fixing. And, you know, I have a couple of ideas, but it, it really is something that the Colts need to, to focus on these next couple of weeks. Yeah, and I don't think all is lost because, I mean, Obviously, the quarterback is not going to change. Like it, it is going to be Gardner the rest of the way. But there are still, there's still philosophy there that they can use to to convert on those. And I think a lot of it comes down to personnel as well. Like the the coaches will always tell you it's about the players. You know that that's what's the straw that stirs the drink. And I mean, just off the top of my head, they they still have all these massive targets. But you rarely see them, you know, run a, a fade pattern. You know, you don't see that a lot. Um, I, I don't know if, you know, maybe Gardner getting outside on those would help a little bit um, more often if they want to roll him out because he is capable of scooting into the end zone himself. We've seen it three times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think getting him out from the mess that is the trenches right there because I feel like a lot of time he's just a little kid in the trees when you see him in the red zone because the field is, is shrunk so much yep. in the red zone. Yep. Um, I think getting him out in the open where he can maybe see better and there's less chaos would help. Uh, but what do you think? Is, is there any, I don't want to say easy fixes because if there were, they would be better at it right now, but what, what wrinkles do you think they could maybe take advantage of to, to make themselves more successful? Yeah. I think the biggest thing I'm looking at is more isolation and more one to two read type plays, which I know is not something you really want to hear too much in an offense is say, Oh, more one read stuff. Cause then what happens when that one read is gone. But I think the Colts need to go back to, I, I, again, I don't want to call them kind of gadgety plays, but plays like the Michael Pittman jr. Game winning touchdown this past week, where it was really just one option on that pass route. It was Michael Pittman jr. Selling the pick play, peeling off into the back of the end zone and scoring that touchdown. That was their one option on that play, but they felt so good about that one call and so good about what kind of look they were going to get by the Titans that they were able to call that play with a lot of confidence that Pittman was going to get open. And it was really isolating your best player in an optimal situation, giving him the leverage to succeed and getting him into the back of the end zone and just giving him a chance. I think they need to go back to more of that stuff. We saw it early in the season too. I mean, even in the, I think it was in the Jacksonville Jaguars blowout loss, uh, the isolated Josh Downs on the backside had him win over the middle and they were able to get him on that quick pass over the middle of the field. We saw with Anthony Richardson early in the season, they had that go-to play where it was that, that RPO uh, QB draw type play in the mm -hmm. red zone. Now I'm not saying you can do that with Gardner Minshew. I'm just saying that have those type of go-to plays where even if it is a one read type play or a two read type play where you're isolating your best players, you got to prevent, you got to get some matchups, some mismatches going here in the trenches to, to find success in the red zone. It can't just be inside zone, inside zone, and then drop back pass where we're going to have four reads on the play. Like that's just not going to work in that condensed area with your backup quarterback. You need to get down into, you know, again, get to your 10 yard line, get to your five yard line, whatever it is, find your couple of plays where you're isolating your playmakers, isolate Michael Pittman jr. In the slot or backside or whatever it has to be and get him the ball. Isolate Josh Downs in one on one situations, get him the ball, spread everybody out and run it up the middle with Zach Moss and get some positive yards. Like, find ways to isolate your best players and let them go to work. You know, just get the ball out of Gardner Minshew's hands, get them to your best players. And look, if they can't get in from there, that's fine, but give them a chance 
to get in the end zone here. I think that's what the issue is here with the Colts. They're getting too cute at times. They're overthinking some things. And as a result, it's leading to either being too conservative or too aggressive uh, and is leading to some mistakes in the red zone. But if they really want to finish drives, get the ball to your playmakers, do what they've been doing on third down this past game where it's like, hey, when in doubt, go to Michael Pittman Jr., he is having a fantastic season this year. He's catching everything thrown his way. Uh, when in doubt, just go to him. You know, it doesn't have to be anything special. It can be a fade, like you're saying. It can be a, a quick slant and just have him win over win after the catch there. It can be a wide receiver screen to him on first or second down. Uh, just get the ball in your playmaker's hands in space and let them do their thing. I think it's a very simplistic fix there, but I think it is something that the Colts can definitely do. I agree. And, and- I mean, there's going to be a natural regression. We've seen Anthony Richardson is apparently automatic in the red zone. He's not there. Jonathan Taylor, you miss a lot with him without him in the red zone because he's always feasted with yep. those those runs inside the five, inside the ten, converting those into touchdowns or at least getting them down towards the goal line. So, I mean, there naturally will be some regression, but I agree with you. Just accentuate your best players. They have the strengths and the abilities to get in there. So it's just going to be an adjustment, but one they have to make. Yeah. I mean, look, again, at the end of the day, they're moving the ball. I can only ask. I've I've been telling you guys for weeks, as long as they have high success rate and an operational offense, I can't complain too much. But let's go that next step. Let's convert some of these red zone opportunities. Let's convert more on third down when we get to the other side of the field and get more than three points on some of these drives. Uh, But coming up, guys, we're going to switch gears to the defense and talk about one of the biggest moves in the whole NFL this week. Grover Stewart's triumphant return to the Indianapolis Colts. We're going to talk about that here in just a second. But first, guys, buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you with killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guaranteed. You can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun that you'll have. I personally love Game Time because it feels like, you know, whenever I'm feeling like being spontaneous or going to a show or something on a whim, I got all these really cool concert venues near me and I'm just dying to get out to uh, recently, I can just go right to them and not have to browse through a bunch of different places. With their flash deals, images of seats, and the lowest price guarantee, game time is the easy choice. Guys, you know, you never want to be stuck behind some stanchion or stuck behind some horrible spot at any concert event or any sporting event. Game time lets you see that seat beforehand, which is awesome. Again, you get those images of your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive and buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Two taps and you are set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to dig through your email and get be that kind of guy. You know, Be that guy in the line that has to dig through email, and then the Wi-Fi is not working, and it's just embarrassing. I'm getting anxiety just thinking about it right <laughs> now. Uh, so snag the tickets without stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, Create an account and redeem code locked on NFL for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And Everydayers Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every single league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Jake, diving into our next topic of today, we're talking about the Colts uh, defense. We're talking about the Colts run defense. We're talking about their defensive line, getting the biggest boost that you could really hope for right now. Uh, And that is Grover Stewart returning to the team. They've been granted their one week roster exemption for Grover coming back. Uh, So he will be activated this week. Shane Steichen talked about him today and just how big of an impact it is uh, to get him back out there. It doesn't look like there's going to be any limitations on Grover Stewart by any means. I mean, from everything I saw from Shane Steichen's press availability today, he said like, look, he's been staying in shape. He's an, he's a professional. We're ready to get him out there. It's going to be a big, big thing for him. Now, Steichen did say that the guys behind him have been playing well, which that's just coach speak. <laughs> There's no chance he actually meant that. But getting Grover Stewart back, I think this is such a massive boost for this Colts defense. And it's something that, you know, all Colts fans should be just so excited about like this run defense has been just brutal the last couple of weeks. Yeah, it's been horrid. I mean, just to put some numbers on it in the six games, he was suited up with the Colts. They allowed less than a hundred yards in three of those games. Uh, they, they had two games that were not great. The Ravens and Rams both ran heavily all over them, but otherwise things were reasonable. I think they were averaging like 114 or something yards against, which is manageable, whatever. But ever since then, 
it's they <laughs> teams have ran below 150 yards on on them just twice in the games ensuing. Like it's been a turnstile ever since, and like an unreasonable amount of production from the opponents. Uh, so it's there. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Num- the numbers don't lie. Uh, very good news that they're getting Grover Stewart back. I mean, he's he's going to have to get back into football shape, of course, but he's also coming off essentially a massive bye week. I mean, <laughs> that, that guy is going to be super fresh. I'm sure he's going to be playing with a chip on his shoulder the, the rest of these five games. I mean, very welcome change. I don't think it's going to be – you know, that whatever that infomercial is with the magic putty or anything like that, just like magically fixes everything. Like one guy doesn't fix all this. Cause I, I think the, you know, the linebacker play probably has to come up a little bit as well. Like there's been some missed tackles and things, but it's going to be the best possible thing that could happen for them to fix. It is happening. I don't know if it's going to cure all, all ills or whatever the, the saying is, but it's the best thing that could happen for them. Look at Jake dropping a Billy Mays commercial uh, here on the podcast. The flex right. tape that is Grover Stewart. Grover Stewart's new nickname is Flex Tape on this podcast, obviously. Like look, look, if he fixes this run defense, we will call him Flex Tape the rest of the season because <laughs> it will take it will take something as great as Flex Tape and a Billy Mays commercial to fix this run defense right now. Uh, but one thing I did want to pose in this segment while we're talking about Grover Stewart, while we're talking about this Indianapolis Colts defense uh, with Grover since Grover Stewart's been out, you know, the Colts are four and two over that span uh, over that, that six game span. Now they all obviously had that horrendous new Orleans saints game where no matter what the saints were doing in that game, they were successful running the ball, passing the ball, whatever it was, it was 70 yards of play basically on that Saints skin, that saints game for that saints offense. Uh, but since then the Colts have essentially conceded the run game. Like I'm not saying they're letting teams run all over them because pride comes in like you're not actually going to let teams just run all over you for the heck of it Uh, but for the most part they're sitting back in coverage they're letting teams get the underneath stuff like the run game like the short passing game they're coming up and making plays Uh, and as a result their past defense has been fantastic they've been uh, one of the better defenses in football over this four game win streak and I actually looked at this I was looking at how important run defense is across the league and I saw four of the top 10 overall defenses in football this year are just putrid run defenses overall. The the Kansas City Chiefs have allowed 4.7 yards per carry this year. The Buffalo Bills, 4.7 yards per carry. The New Orleans Saints, 4.5 yards per carry against. The Cincinnati Bengals, 5.0 yards per carry against. Uh, These are top 10 scoring defenses in football that are just horrible against the run, but they lock it up in the red zone. They lock it up on third down. Uh, They get turnovers. So, again, I'm not saying that Grover Stewart coming back is not that important, but it's kind of like the Colts defense was still working despite this horrendous run defense these past couple weeks. Now I know it was agonizing to watch, but you know, it was kind of working and having Grover Stewart just to bring that number back down a little bit can only help. But I, I did find it very interesting that it's like, it's a weird correlation that the Colts run defense was getting worse and worse every single week, but their overall defense was looking better and better. If that mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah, that's bend but don't break for you. I mean, yeah. they're bending to the run game, but they're they're not feeding a bunch of points. You know, they're not losing. Uh, they've they've had their performances where they've locked down opponents overall in general. So, I think you're right. I mean, just because teams aren't very good against the run, that's when you got to create turnovers. You got to get sacks. You have to get on third down. That's you have to be good in those areas if you're going to be so weak in that. So, the Colts luckily for them they've they've been able to get away with that so yeah yeah, i mean looking at these next five opponents you know you you mentioned you know the Bengals are on there that that's this next one i mean if if you guys they're the game as we're talking is is on right now against the jaguars i've already seen the jaguars have some nice plays against the Bengals. so you know looking at it right away who knows yeah. Yeah. One thing I do want to say, though, is, you know, with these next five games, the Colts are playing a lot of backup caliber quarterbacks. Obviously, they have C.J. Stroud uh, in the final game of the year. But before that, it's all pretty much backup quarterbacks, you know, the rest of the way mm-hmm. for the Indianapolis Colts defense. And while I did say the Colts have been fine with conceding in the run game a little bit over this four game win streak, obviously, you'd rather have teams be in third and eight, third and nine more often by stopping that run early to, on the early downs. And what happens when you stop the run on those first and second downs, like we saw during that that dead period of, of Titans offense in this past game, is you allow this Colts pass rush that has been on fire recently to just get after it. 
You know, if you're if you're having more third and nines, third and eights with the way Samson Ebu Collins been playing, Quiddy Pay has been playing, Dio Dangbo, DeForest Buckner, all those guys getting after it, you're only helping your defense even more. So I didn't want to say that I'm not excited about Grover Stewart coming back when I mentioned that run defense thing. I was like, you know what? I like the way the Colts countered not having Grover Stewart, but let's get our stud back in there. We need him out there. He's going to help this defense. And this is one of the biggest like late season returns I can think of. Uh, for a playoff chasing team. I mean, this is a massive, massive deal for the Colts and uh, Grover Stewart's impact cannot be uh, understated whatsoever. Yeah, it's big. The, the rich are getting richer. Like you said, 21 sacks the last four games. Now they're getting their stud nose tackle back. So uh, coming up here in a second, we're going to look at the back end of it. You know, this is a, a secondary that's been banged up. There's been some guys shifting in and out. Are they good enough if the Colts, you know, do punch their ticket to the postseason? Are they good enough to, to face with some of these quarterbacks? All right, everyone, I know we come to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of real life. But can we talk just for a minute about preparing for real life? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. It's scary, just to put to put it simply. Uh, it can be such a helpless feeling, parents. I mean, I know you're right there with me. Uh, when your kid gets sick, while a supply chain issue keeps them from life saving medication that they may need, we've seen it before with you know formula shortages, medication. Like it's not pretty, and it's it's nerve wracking. Thankfully, we'll be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses including UTIs, respiratory infections, uh, sinusitis, skin infections, among others. This stuff could happen to any of us. Visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost, because that's its own thing, pharmacy costs. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com and use offer code locked on to get $20 off your order. All right, Zach. So let's talk about this secondary. It's uh it's changed quite a bit from what we forecasted at the beginning of the season. But honestly, I think performance-wise, it's it's gone about how we expected. Uh there's it's still a very young group. Uh, right now, it's Jalen Jones and Daryl Baker Jr., two very inexperienced players coming into it. Um, but, you know, some definite learning curves. I mean, Baker got benched at the beginning of the season and is brought back because Juju Brents got hurt. Uh, we finally got to see an extended period of Nick Cross in this one. Uh, still, it's a young group. They all have had their, their low moments. But in general, I've been pleasantly surprised with the fact that you can set these guys out there and they're not getting feasted on in every matchup. They have had their moments where they've stepped up. Um, so what do you think? Is this secondary good enough once they get past this non-murderer's row of quarterbacks that they're about to face in these last five weeks, or even with some of them? I mean, do you, do you think they're good enough to kind of go up with the big boys of the league? I think as long as they are playing within structure and with the calls of the defense, they can be good enough. I think they got the length. I think they've got the technique. I think they know what they're doing back there. Jalen Jones, I think, has played really well within structure and within the calls when he when he has the proper read. Uh, I think Daryl Baker Jr. has really impressed the past two weeks. I think as Jalen Jones has struggled with the top matchup the last two games, Daryl Baker Jr. on the backside has been playing some really good football. A lot of pass breakups last week against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He had a couple pass breakups as mm -hmm. well, uh, doing some really good things on that backside. Uh, now, do I think they're good enough to compete with prolific pass offenses? Probably not, uh, purely because, look, they're a, young, they're a young tandem that is going to get burned by coverage mistakes in terms of, you know, just not knowing where to be on certain coverage calls and, and maybe not matching the right receiver or not matching the right route concept and stuff like that because they're still learning the concepts that are in front of them. Heck, the Colts defense has changed drastically since early in the season. So they're still trying to learn, you know, going from a cover three defense for most of the offseason to, oh, hey, we're doing a lot of quarters now. Hey, we're doing a lot of cover two now. Uh, now we're doing a lot of match concepts from those calls instead of doing cover three match concepts. So it is a kind of a different animal uh, with those things. Uh, and then I think there is some issues with, you know, if 
you were to go against a prolific passing offense, like let, let's talk about the Texans in, in the final week of the season, CJ Stroud, uh, Nico Collins is playing some outstanding football. You know, if there were going to be some one-on-one shots where there is going to be a jump off for it, you know, Jalen Jones and Daryl Baker Jr. Haven't had many pass breakups this season. They are playing some good football overall. Like I'm not saying they're playing bad football, but they're not really making too many plays on the ball. Mostly what they're doing is they're playing within structure and playing within their technique and forcing errant throws or forcing uh, receivers to make mistakes. They're not really making plays on the ball right now. You know, I don't think either of them, neither of them have interceptions this year. Uh, I think Baker Jr. has a couple pass breakups. Jalen Jones, I think has two on the season. So I, I think, you know, you can live with them. I don't think they're major liabilities, but also I can acknowledge that they need to, you know, it, it probably needs to be better for you to make a big playoff run. I think there is real concern uh, for a playoff run or even for when they play against C.D. Stroud in week 18 or even when they play next week. You know, I'm not saying Jake Browning is this fantastic quarterback, but Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, uh, Tyler Boyd, like that's a concerning trio of wide receivers against uh, some young and experienced corners, no matter who's playing quarterback. So I think there's real reason to be concerned. Hopefully Juju Brents can come back and alleviate some of those concerns going forward. But I do think both these guys are playing as well as they can play right now. Like they're not playing bad football. They're playing very solid, adequate football for who they are. But is that good enough when it comes to a playoff race or in the playoffs? Probably not. But I, you know, I'm, I'm, what else are you going to do? You know, what else are you going to do? These are, this is where we're at with these guys. They're playing as well as they can. I think I'm, I'm ready for them to prove me wrong, but I'm a little concerned going forward, especially after these last two weeks where, the Colts have played against Mike Evans. They've played against DeAndre Hopkins and Jalen Jones, rightfully, as a seventh-round corner, has struggled in those matchups. He should not be the top corner on the team. He, he yeah. should not be playing against those guys. But that's the, that's the situation we're in right now. I'm concerned if Jalen Jones is the top corner going into these bigger matchups against better receivers and against better quarterbacks. But as of right now, again, I think these guys have played well. I think they're doing as well as they can. Uh, but I think it is kind of concerning seeing how they've played against better wide receivers the last two weeks. Yeah, and oddly enough, let's just let's just say postseason play. There are some matchups where I don't think it's going to be the end of the world. Let's say they go against the Chiefs. They've had a lot of issues with their receivers. I mean, Patrick Mahomes is a, a wizard, but yeah. there's been a lot of issues with that receiving core. Uh, the Jaguars, I think we've seen how that goes. Probably not going to be pretty, even though they nope. contain Calvin I'll Ridley. In the anybody, matchup. anybody else with the Jaguars, <laughs> the Colts make the playoffs. But Please, that, that, Lord. Yeah, that might be looking ahead a little too much there, but Dol Dolphins as know. well, probably not going to go great. <laughs> right, but. right, right. Yeah, these guys aren't world beaters. I think they're good enough for what the Colts need them to do this year. But, mm. you know, obviously you want Juju Brents back. You probably want another playmaker on the outside. You would love to have Dallas Flowers back as well. But, you know, this is the state of where we are, where we are with this cornerback room. Uh, but while we're talking secondary, I mean, two guys we don't have to worry about, Julian Blackman and Kenny Moore II. Whew, they have been fantastic in recent weeks. I think Julian mm -hmm. Blackman is really coming to his own as a strong safety. You're not really seeing many coverage busts from him whatsoever anymore. Kenny Moore is doing Kenny Moore things all season long. Uh, so the only other thing we really need to talk about with the secondary when it comes to concern is what is going on at free safety? <laughs> you know, Ronnie Thomas has not had the best season. Uh, I think we've been saying this for weeks on here that you probably should get Nick Cross some looks. Then Nick Cross comes in for a lot of this past game. Like it still was, a, I think it was a 67 to 31% split or something, or like something around there. 67% uh, split to like 30 something percent split. Uh, but Nick Cross comes in and I think he looked really good in all of his snaps. Like I, there wasn't a moment out there where I thought he looked out of place or mm -hmm. out of position. He made almost every tackle attempt he had a chance at, which is a big improvement over Rodney Thomas. So, you know, Jake, what, what do we do at free safety? Is it time to just give it all to Nick Cross or what will the Colts actually do something like that? I mean, I think they need to continue doing what they're doing because at this point it's an evaluation stage. And I mean, just be honest with your evaluation and go from there. If Rodney Thomas is performing better, okay, then then you know, whittle that back down a little bit, that ratio. But if Nick Cross keeps making plays, which he is. I mean, because he also plays like a strong safety out there. I think he does very well attacking what's in front of him. Uh, we've seen him make big stops in each of the last couple weeks. Uh, he was in the right place at the right time for that pass breakup. Whether or not it should have been a penalty in the end zone is neither here nor there. Clean, but clean pass breakup. But clean there was no breakup. there was no penalty called. Uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, the guy. I feel like in such a short 
sample size this year, we've said Nick Cross's name more than we have Rodney Thomas's. And yeah. Thomas has played the vast majority of the snaps. Now he to his, you know, to his benefit, he does have a couple picks in this latter half of the season. Like he has started to turn it up a little bit. I think he looks better recently than he did the first several weeks of the year. Yeah. But at the same time, you can't really you can't really deny that he has been involved in the coverage when there has been these big busts in coverage. He is yeah. often involved in it, him and Jones. Uh, I would say they've been the most frequent flyers when it comes to whose fault was it. It was over here on this side, and this this receiver just made a big play in between these two guys. Yeah. I mean, that that more often than not has been the combination. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I'm curious to see if this Nick Cross rotation in this game was – Gus Bradley saying, hey, I need my better tackling safety out there because Derrick Henry's running all over us, so let's get mm. Nick Cross some more snaps. Or if it is a sign of things to come, like Nick Cross is going to get some real snaps. I think this next game will be a huge marker for that because the Bengals typically don't run the ball super well. They're doing it right now on Monday Night Football. They're running the ball really well. Right. Uh, but typically they don't run the ball at a very efficient pace, but they do throw the ball pretty well because they have those top-tier receivers. Uh, so we'll see if Nick Cross still gets some snaps in there. But uh, yeah, I think in like 50 something defensive snaps this year, Nick Cross has like five or six defensive tackles. Like he's he's playing some good football when he's getting snaps, just getting him more snaps on the field. And I think this Colts secondary will be okay. Uh, but I think that's all we have for today, guys. If you guys don't, don't already, make sure you're following at Locked on Colts, at Jake Arthur NFL, and at Zach Hicks 2 all on X. Also, subscribe to us on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. We'd love your guys' range reviews, and we'll see you guys back here bright and early tomorrow morning.